on behalf of uh, St. Joseph's College of Arts and Science and Toto Funds the Arts, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you uh, for this evening's creative journey. This is the sixth talk in the TFA's Creative Journeys lecture series, <clears throat> in which we have the opportunity to listen to the journeys of young and experienced artists, where they share their influences, impulses, process, and thinking that has shaped their art. The previous speakers of this particular series have been painter and poet Geet Patel, visual artist Jitish Kala, theatre director Sunil Shanbar, choreographer and dancer Surupa Sen, and poet Shampurna Chakaji. So today we have a very special guest as well. Uh, before I introduce him, let me read a little line which was said about him in the Dominion Post in New Zealand. It said, Shushmit Sen's fluid guitar lines recall Jerry Garcia and John McLaughlin at their best. Founder and lead guitarist of Indian Ocean, a person who found a sound that is uncompromisingly his own. He <coughs> has traveled across the world performing in various places with uh, Indian Ocean and also post Indian Ocean with uh, performing solo and with his new band, an ensemble called the Shushmit Sen Chronicles. Most people here are, of course, familiar uh, with Shushmit's work, which has been a work of two decades at least. And we are very, very proud and very happy at uh, Toto Funds the Arts and at St. Joseph's College to have him here this evening to speak to us about his long, interesting, and ongoing creative journey, Shushmit Sen. I would like you all to please, please switch off your mobile phones and don't send SMSs so that others can read them behind you. So please switch them off and also please don't click any photographs during this creative journey. Thank you so much. Shushmit Sen. And thanks, TFA. Uh, St. Joseph's College. Well, uh, I was never meant to talk. And uh, unfortunately, I see more and more people who want to come and, you know, uh, they want me to come and talk as much as possible. But uh, anyways, today what I want to do is uh, tell you a little bit about uh, uh, my life, uh, especially my musical journey. And um, uh, beyond that, uh, I would like this session to be as interactive as possible. And um, so I'll tell you exactly how my music started. It uh, started like uh, uh, there was a guitar which was bought for my elder brother. And uh, my father got that uh, uh, the guitar for him. And it was lying around. I must have been my seventh or eighth standard. That's the time I picked it up, and I started strumming in a very, very, very uh, mundane way. Probably picked up some chords, and uh, also, if I remember correctly, sang a few songs, something like Bob Dylan and some Beatles, and so on and so forth. But uh, as time went by, I uh, was introduced to and. There were all kinds of influences. I liked music all, you know, um, right from the very beginning, but was never really passionate about it. Till the time I heard Indian classical music. And that was, that came to me around uh, 11th, 12th standard. And uh, I used to go and uh, listen to these uh, amazing performances by four of probably the world's greatest musicians were at that point of time performing at their peak. And I had the privilege of seeing them not just once or twice, each one of them at least seven, eight, ten times. And there were people like um, Nikhil Banerjee, there was um, Ali Akbar Khan Sahib, Bhim Sen Joshi, Manika Arjun Mansur. Unfortunately, none of them are there anymore. And what pulled me in was, I've never learned music, I've never learned, I still do not know which is, which, what is, you know, uh, if somebody is singing a particular raga, I won't be able to recognize almost all of them. 
Okay, just a handful of them probably are Malkos, I might recognize, I might recognize apparently. But uh, by and large, I really would not be able to make out what ragas they are playing. But um, the question is that if I did not understand the ragas, what did I get out of that? What actually really, really pulled, pulled me to those, uh, this thing, A, each time they would sing a different raga, it would be a different mood. And uh, they had this capability of transporting you to completely into another world. And that capability is something which can only happen if you can lose yourself in your own music. And that quality of meditation and uh, the med meditative quality is what I really, really liked. And that is what pulled me into music much, much more. And I got to realize that you can really feel the depths of life through music. So slowly and steadily what happened, my guitar playing style changed. And uh, I was no lo longer playing those chords, I was no longer singing those uh, 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 songs. Although the, the reason of picking up the guitar was, uh, well, when you're at that, that age, you know that you pick up the guitar, sing a few Bob Dylan songs, sing a few songs which are known to others, and you have a lot of women around you. And, uh, but when I, when I picked up this particular new style, uh, nobody was interested. So it was a completely a very lonely journey. I used to just lock myself up in, in, a, in a particular room, figure out certain uh, notes of a scale, and just try and improvise as much as possible to see exactly how much more I could do with that mood and how I could explore that. So that's how I developed a completely, I think, a different style of playing the guitar. And uh, some, sometime in my first year college, I started composing. And I composed the first piece, if I remember correctly, it was Euphoria, which came into Indian Ocean much later. And then I composed uh, Melancholic Ecstasy, I composed Torrent. And um, that's, uh, that's the time uh, some of the seniors in my college said that you, you must go and take uh, part in these competitions, in these uh, uh, college festivals. So I, um, I went for it about three or four of them. And that's the time I realized that at least for any form of art, competition is not the right thing. It's not the correct thing because A, you do not know who are the judges. And B, who gives you the right to judge in any case? And, um, and also, uh, the judges have a certain format in their minds and if they do not hear something which falls within those, those formats. Um, they probably uh, would not quite like that particular person who's competing in that, uh, in those festivals. So I did uh, participate in about three or four and got the first prize only in my own college. And obviously for obvious reasons. Um, but from there onwards, I grew a kind of a hatred towards all these competitions. So much so that I personally feel that that competition and uh, this uh, comparative logic is a, it's quite a detrimental thing in our human lives. And if you can stand on your own and if you can do what you want to do and express yourself in a very, very individualistic manner, I think nothing can be better than that. But unfortunately, the world is governed by competition at this point of time. Nevertheless, uh, so I um, started composing and uh, uh, then I participated in a particular opera called Operama, which happened in 1982. And uh, continued my own journey. <coughs> Studies had to happen. I had to pick up a job because that is what was, was the norm. I, on the side, I did a management uh, course also. For 10 years, I kept working. But uh, my passion for music kept growing. And I never ever stopped playing uh, my guitar and composing. So much so that uh, I remember when I was in one of the companies working, uh, my job was to go to Bombay from Delhi. I'm from Delhi. Uh, so I used to go to uh, Bombay uh, 15 days a month. And uh, I used to carry my guitar 
and uh, after I finished my work, I used to go to the Burevali National Park and sit there and just play for hours. And that's the time my boss actually uh, told me, you know, you were probably using the company's money to go to Bombay to record. And I hadn't even seen a, uh, a studio by then. But nevertheless, this continued and I realized slowly and steadily that the job thing is not for me. And I had to get out of it sometime or the other. So uh, it was in... Uh, but before uh, I gave up my job, I, uh, uh, I started playing as a duo with Oshim. I Sometime uh, late school, early college I met him and I uh, um, met him at a common friend's place where they had a band called Niharika. And I used to go there and sit there while they used to practice. And um, so we started exchanging ideas. He liked my style of playing and we started jamming together. And in 1986, we were called for the first show. It was not called Indian Ocean, it was uh, Sushmit Oshim Do, where he was on tabla and other percussion and me on the guitar, no vocals. So uh, we went for this particular uh, uh, <coughs> show in Roorkee. I remember it was uh, Roorkee. They were having a kind of a festival. And uh, the festival was being organized by the second and the third year students. And the people who were the main organizers for the main festival were not involved in that. So when we went to perform there, I remember the main organizers were very offended and they wanted to come and disrupt the show. So we were supposed to be the grand finale and the first show being the grand finale and there were about uh, not less than a hundred people who had come to hoot and disrupt the show. It was so loud, the, the hooting, that uh, we were sitting right in the front row of the stage, from you know, in front of the stage and the other performers, performers who came up on stage, we could not hear a single thing that they were singing. So we were well, I'm sure I was very, very nervous, so was Oshin. And we went up on stage, we were given a fantastic uh, um, uh, introduction. And then when I started playing, it was a kind of an ala, within about 10 to 15 seconds there was pin drop silence. We were supposed to play for about 40 or 45 minutes. We ended up playing for an hour and a half. And then we were called back to Rurki um, the next year again. So that's, that's where the performances started. And then I realized if that was the kind of reaction that we got from a crowd which had never even heard of us and obviously had not heard the kind of music that we would play. Um, what um, uh, There must have been something that attracted them to our music. So I wanted to expand this, uh, the, the sound of what we were doing. And uh, that's the time the idea of a band came in. So I went around looking for different people. And finally, there were a set of people, which included obviously Oshi. And there were three bass players, because the kind of compositions that I had did not follow chord patterns. And uh, bass players normally, by and large, follow chord patterns, at least in those days. Today a lot of things have changed and bass players have really changed the way they uh, inter interact with the other musicians in terms of music. But in those days, people would play just rock and roll, rock, blues. So if you don't give them a chord pattern, they would not know what to do. So there were three different bass players taking chunks of different compositions and playing them. So in a show, there will be one number played by one bass player and the number played by another bass player. So that is that is how it is. It used to be. And there was Shalin Sharma on the drums who was there with us till 94. Uh, Slowly and steadily, um, uh, the, the lineup kept changing initially. And that's, I think, what happens with almost all bands. Um, so in, uh, in 1990, I formed the band. 91, Rahul joined. <coughs> 94, Shalin Sharma was playing the drums, he left. That's the time uh, I knew exactly who to get because uh, I watched Amit playing at a, uh, in another band. After Indian Ocean had played, another band came up, young band, and they started uh, performing. And I quite liked the tightness of the band and realized the tightness was 
uh, realized that the tightness was uh, because of the drama. So when Charlene decided to leave, I knew exactly who I needed to contact. So I contacted uh, Amit, which in those days there were no cell phones and various things. It took me quite a while to get him to the practice place and then he joined. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, I mean, how I came to the conclusion that I would like to express and so on and so forth, what kind of music actually influenced me? I would like you to hear one of the things. The first introduction that I had to music, a musical co concert, was that of uh, a gentleman called Nirmalindu Chaudhuri. He's a, he was a, a Bengali. Uh, what you call a Bhatiyali singer, the boatman's songs. And uh, I was just about 10 years old at that point of time. And uh, I believe that I was so stunned by the performance that I had my mouth open. And my parents had to keep telling me, you, keep, you know, shut your mouth, you know. That's not how you uh, behave in public. So <laughs> this gentleman had immense power because when you sing uh, on the boats, on the river, you need to get across across the banks of the river. You know, from one bank to the other, you should be heard. So that's the kind of power that uh, uh, Nirmalanda Chaudhary had. So when the show started, there was uh, the complete band on stage. There were four singers, backup singers. There were there was a tabla, there was a dotara, there was a harmonium, there was uh, dholak, the khol, everything. And they were all playing through um, uh, through the microphones and it was there on the PA and Nirmal and Chaudhary was not there. And suddenly we hear this tar coming from the back. In those days there were no cordless mics, nothing. So it was absolutely bare voice coming from the back. He was walking down the aisle, overshadowing each and every instrument which were coming out to the loudspeakers. So that was my first experience of absolute raw energy. I would like to share that particular uh, thing because that was one of the things that had that came as an influence. And this computer is not on. <coughs> One second. I think Lika, you'll have to come up and do something. Should I switch it on or does it come on? Now I think it's come on. It's going to take some time to boot. Till the time this boots up. Uh, uh, when um, with Indian Ocean went for our uh, first recording, the first recording was when actually I went and recorded a demo. Um, uh, that's the time uh, when Rahul was not there, Amit was not there, there was Charlene, there was uh, uh, our bass player did not have a bass, so there was another friend who lent him a bass. So we recorded a particular uh, demo track. And uh, there was one gentleman who had promised me that he is going to fund that particular recording. And uh, when I reached the studio with the rest of the band, uh, well, there was um, the that gentleman was not there, so I called him up and he said that, "Oh, Sushmit, you know, today I am a bit short of cash. Can you just pay it from your pocket, and uh, I'll uh, pay it to you tomorrow or day after." said that if I had the money, why should I have asked you? Okay, so uh, I had to go ahead with the recording. So whatever little money that I had, I gave it to the owners of the studio. And I had an electric guitar which I had bought. And it was uh, yeah, the only electric guitar I had for just probably a few months. And I bartered it for that particular recording. So one day we did 45 minutes of songs and, and different tracks being played and so on and so forth. This is, I think, at today's date, extremely commendable because uh, uh, we now take months to record one album. In fact, my last album, I can tell you, including the mixing, mastering, and refining each and every track, we took a good five to six months. And in one day, we had been, you know, recorded a 40, 40, 40 to 45 minutes of a demo. And then finally, uh, we, uh, HMB uh, liked that particular uh, demo, so called us to Kolkata to record. 
that was also quite an ordeal actually because uh, 91 they accepted and we signed the contract or rather I signed the contract and then um, uh, beginning 91 that happened end 92 they took us for a recording uh, so two years we were just waiting when are they going to take us so uh, and they took another full year to release the album so three years we did not know what to do um, but uh, uh, coming to the recording when we went to Dum Dum and uh, recorded there it was a very very old studio it was known for the fact that Ravindranath Tagore had recorded there and I think that was the only thing good about the studio because the studio, the, the, the mixer was a huge mixer with, um, with the faders were like a gear you know you would push it up and down like that and the recording engineer used to sit with the who used to come drunk in the morning and used to get more and more drunk through, uh, through the day. And uh, uh, he used to place the ashtray on top of the mixer, which is unheard, unheard of in today's day. You know, yeah. it's it. It's it. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, when the sound engineer got more and more drunk, what happened was that I, you, if you hear that particular first album, you won't hear any reverb. Because whenever we ask for reverb, he used to show the knob and say, read the full end. What are you asking for? So in his drunkenness, he was hearing lots of reverb, but we didn't, <laughs> you know. So um, um, anyways, um, that's the time. Now the main recording booth was bigger than a badminton court where you could have easily recorded a 40-piece orchestra. And uh, the, there were two uh, soundproof doors, which were like those... Uh, those... Um, uh, the cold storage doors, if you've seen the metal, those thick ones. So one would shut, and then there was a little, small, little space, and then again you open another one and get into the recording booth. So the main sound engineer, who was not the sound engineer for the album, had come and told us when he had recorded Nirmal in the Chaudhary that when he would sing that with through those doors also when they had the faders down to zero they could hear, still hear him so he had that kind of a voice so I'm going to play you one song of his just to give you an idea of what kind of a voice he had No, I think you have to. Okay, I think. I agree. Right. Open with. Yeah. This is just a song, there is no visual to it.
you think of it, we have in this gathering today Jaydi Verma. And Jaydi Verma happens to be the director of a film that was made on uh, Indian Ocean called Leaving Home. And I think somewhere there, there's my book that I wrote, my memoir. So all that I'm speaking about actually is there in both Leaving Home as well as my book. So if you go through them, you'll be able to know uh, not just what I'm telling you, but probably more than that. Um, anyways, uh, so you heard that particular song. What is, what is uh, amazing is that when you have a very loud voice, normally the lower uh, frequencies in your voice get cut off. But this gentleman had that poise and uh, and uh, yeah, the, the depth in you know when you when you are soft as well as when you are trying to be very very loud. So there's a beautiful balance in both the sides, which normally you is you, you see it's lacking in most voices. <coughs> Anyways. So um, uh, another thing that, what, uh, that, that uh, has influenced me a lot was uh, the fact that my father used to travel a lot and he used to travel around the world. He was with the Ministry of Industries and uh, wherever he would go, he used to get me certain albums. Um, so I had uh, albums from uh, different East European countries, Russian albums, German albums. So uh, I grew up listening to a lot of stuff that normally people do not listen to. And uh, also I uh, realized that, that uh, the English hegemony has taken away a lot from us. And uh, that English hegemony, because we do not tend to listen to stuff which are not in English or is not being praised by the English speaking population. So I would play one more video, and that's the last video that I'm going to play, just to show you that there are uh, um, again. I've lost it, Lika. Should I get out of this? So this is uh, this is a lady called Mari.
because uh, Mari Boy, she is a Norwegian and uh, she comes from the northern province of uh, uh, Norway and uh, the Norwegians actually do not understand their language and they, uh, Mari Boy from where she belongs, those people are actually quite upset about the fact that they are being ruled by the Norwegians. They do not want to be a part of that and quite a few of her songs actually talks about the woes of being ruled by somebody else. Uh, anyways, uh, just like her, um, there are immense amount of other music which is not English. Or, and uh, she is very, very popular in, uh, in various circles in uh, Europe right now. But lots of East European countries. I remember growing up listening to balalaika. And the balalaika is an instrument which is the maestro is played in a way that sometimes you can mistake it with a sitar. And uh, some of the most liveliest of uh, instrumental music that I've heard, I've uh, heard on uh, the balalaika. So there's a Rus Russian accordion, the, you know, other kinds of accordions. In fact, there's this gentleman from Hungary called uh, Oros Zoltan who's played in my last album. Uh, what what an amazing now if I, I can I can keep on uh, showing you so many different kinds of music but then there won't be any talk and I would also probably like to play something for you and um, in these kind of music what I personally like is uh, so um, I like music with a lot of poise which Indian classical firstly taught me. And uh, I have heard that poise in some jazz musicians, in certain compositions. There's a composition called uh, Romantic Warrior by, uh, by uh, Chick Corea. Um, it's, a, it's a band called Return to Forever. So there are, there are uh, various different kinds of music which has a lot of poise. And you know, from Africa, you've got you know, people like uh, uh, Ali Farkature, then um, Baba Mal. So, one has to open up uh, your mind uh, to, to be able to get the expressions from all over the world. So what I would like to do now is probably play a piece which I think in my own way I would like to like to express what I mean by poise. So I'll just invite it up.
funny, funny noise coming. It's okay.
Anyways, um, where was I about? So uh, I was talking about the poise and so on and so forth. Well, uh, when you when you hear poise in Indian classical, at this point of time, because of the paucity of time, I'm mean, I mean, easily taking this particular piece to uh, to a much much greater length, much much longer, you know, elucidating each and every part. But uh, that would have taken much much longer. That's about it. Uh, so uh, this is the kind of music I really wanted to do right from the very beginning. And um, uh, slowly that thing came into the band, Indian Ocean. <coughs> you know, uh, compositions like Melancholic Ecstasy, then there was Torrent, then there was uh, From the Ruins. So um, uh, that's how the journey be uh, began. And initially Indian Ocean was also a completely an in instrumental band. But um, I always liked Oshin singing, and um, uh, I remember pushing him as much as possible to start singing and uh, slowly he started singing. So uh, there was uh, the first bit of uh, our first album I had about uh, 40 seconds of vocals in that 45 minutes of uh, an album. So um, uh, that was Oshin basically taking off on a Bharti Alec kind of a tune. So that's how uh, voice was introduced to uh, Indian Ocean and Rahul started singing. Then there was beautiful synergy that happened between the singers. Later on, um, Amit also started singing. He's a fantastic singer. He's highly, highly underutilized uh, in the band. But uh, he is also a fabulous singer. And he has uh, shown his singing skills in various different songs. So by and large, uh, what we tried to do was to get as much out of a person, if a person could sing like I couldn't. I actually used to sing, sing at one point of time, but uh, when I did not sing for a long time, and my, my ears really uh, <coughs> became very sensitive towards notes. Whenever I sing, I realize that I'm going off and I shut up. And, uh, but I did do certain amount of harmonies and things like that in the band. So slowly and steadily the whole thing uh, kept on uh, moving, our first album came out, it did very well for that particular time because there was no MTV, nothing and um, uh, none of the, uh, although people did not have the uh, ways to listen to the song like you have the internet right now, um, it did sell about 50,000 copies which was quite good and uh, in those days 50,000 copies was a huge number. And uh, we thought that now people will come running to us. Nobody came. We went to these different music companies that now we have, we are a success. Why don't you uh, record us? They said that um, your first album was a fluke. Your next album will be a flop. So nobody was a taker there. So in '97, we had a fluke recording. There was this uh, sound engineer called Vikram Mishra who was there and he was at the last moment given a tag team and uh, I remember giving it to him and uh, asking him to record the album, uh, the performance. It was the 1st uh, of January, Sahemat always every 1st of January we have this show in uh, the memory of Sardar Hashmi. So we performed and we forgot about the recording. So one friend of ours in Canada, he asked for it again because he was there at the show, can I listen to it? So we recorded it onto a normal cassette and sent it across to him. So he called back saying that, listen guys, this is releasable. This is a, a fantastic recording. So he then heard it seriously and saw, yes, it was uh, really, really nice. And uh, even today when I hear that piece, uh, the, the, the album, and I, I wonder how, how the hell did we play that well. Um, so we went to the uh, music companies uh, again and they again said that uh, well nobody listens to live music out here. So we were quite disappointed. So I went to an, uh, a dealer who I used to work with uh, in HMB and uh, he said that I don't even want to listen to the recording. I have sold so many of your previous albums that I will form a company to release this album. So this company was formed, formed called Independent Music and he released the uh, album and since he did not have a reach to go and sell in Bombay, Kolkata, you know, anywhere else but Delhi and surrounding areas 
it probably would have reached a little bit to Pushkar or uh, Jaipur and uh, maximum Lucknow, you know. And when that album sold more than 50,000 copies, that's the first time the music companies actually turned around and said that, okay, fine, we have something out here, we need to look into it. So we had talks with various different people and finally signed up with Times Music for Kandisa. And Kandisa got released. And for the first time ever, our uh, music was advertised. Our album was advertised. So for the first time we saw you know, half-page ads coming out in um, Times of India. Uh, but the, uh, the, the funny part was that they wanted to sell the album, not the band. So, uh, Kandisa was written in a huge way, Indian Ocean was in very, very small fonts. So, people got to know what was a Kandisa, but people did not know that it was Indian Ocean's number. So, lots of people knew our songs, but it, 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 it used to be surprising for them to hear this band play it. Oh, is it actually your song? So, uh, so again, the band did not get that kind of popularity, but slowly and steadily we went in, uh, after that we did Chini, then came Black Friday, Black Friday being a Bollywood movie, that got a lot of publicity. So, the journey just kept going up, till the time, um, well, what can I say, um, till the time possibly we lost Oshi. And, uh, but, uh, I would uh, say that even before we lost Oshim in 2009, December, um, the time had come for me to start looking out for other venues to move on because I realized that you know you live once in a lifetime and I wanted to but when Oshim died I realized that I had to keep this band going so the complete focus went back to Indian Ocean. Something is making some funny noises. Anyways. Uh, so, um, so we had to uh, look out for a singer and a tabla player because we used to do both the things together and then finally get the band going. And it was quite uncanny that the busiest year that Indian Ocean had was 2010. That was after Oshin died in 2009, December. And we did 88 shows that year, all over the world. And uh, yeah, the, the international tour also, we, we started our international tours in 2001. So uh, the band was about 11 years old and once it started, it did not seem to end. And we were just traveling all over the place. Which probably also took a toll on us because there have been times where we have played 24 shows in 22 days. I have played six shows in six days in three different countries, in six different cities. So you can imagine you're traveling, you're doing, going through immigration, you're, you know, you do not sleep for days to come. And when we lost Oshim, I think that was also a very strengthful uh, thing uh, for us because we were out for two continuous months. We went to Russia for almost two or three weeks. We came back for one, one and a half days and uh, then went off to the US and we toured the whole of US and we were coming back from there where in Qatar, we, uh, uh, Oshim had the first cardiac arrest. And um, yeah, that's, that's the other side of being a performer. Because when you start performing and you're traveling continuously, it was almost like we were spending half our time flying. You were in the air. So, uh, well, um, after that, uh, I continued for a while. Once the band again settled down and was performing, I decided, decided to move out just about two years back. And I've formed uh, now the Chronicles, and the Chronicles is, we are getting shows, not too many, but yes, it's slowly increasing. And uh, I, my first album without Indian Ocean was Depths of the Ocean, which came out in 2012, 11, late 11, I think. And uh, then about seven or eight months back, the Ocean to Ocean, the last album, came out with uh, a memoir that I had written through Harper Collins, 
and I chose to go through with HarperCollins because in today's day, CDs do not sell. If you go to a music company, they would probably print about 500, 1000 copies. Whereas a HarperCollins, people still read books. Uh, they cannot rip it off the internet. So uh, the numbers are much, 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 much more. And uh, you can also, you can also rip it from the internet. You can pay and get it also, and you can rip it for free too. That's your choice. But yeah, I think I have talked about my journey in uh, in brief. So now, if you have any questions, any kind of anybody wants to ask any question, then I I shall. Uh, if you want the details of anything that I've just talked about, and if no, then I will go ahead and play a couple of more pieces. Okay, can I have some light uh, on the audience, please? Yeah, and let this be. Even when I play, let this be because it's good to see the audience. Yeah. Question: My name is Nikesh, uh -huh. and my question is: You talk about learning music through feeling, yes. feeling the music. Yes. But when we start to learn music today, there is a lot of structure put to it. How does one balance so between when you say structure? What do you mean by structure? Let's say reading music. Reading, right? Or yes. so how do you? So you can trade off the speed of learning hmm. versus trying to just feel it. So how do you trade it off? Does it? Yeah. Look, the thing is that this, the, the, the technicalities, okay, uh, I don't know how to read, but I compose. I, when I compose music, I tell people, if I compose something for the vocals, I can play it on the guitar and sure probably hum it out for the person. Uh, I will compose the bass parts out here. If I'm composing something for the piano, that also I do on the guitar and tell them exactly just how um, I uh, go about by playing it out. I, I, I do not know how to read and write. So there are ways of uh, getting around it uh, and uh, talking about it. Uh, of the, um, yeah, you need not be reading uh, music unless and until you are a Western classical musician. If you are a Western classical musician, if you do not have a score in front of you, you are redundant. And uh, unless and until you know how to memorize long pieces. It could be a, a two hour, one hour, one and a half hour piece if you are playing a symphony or something of that sort. So um, uh, there are there are definitely um, uh, ways of uh, playing music. Look, the thing is that the notations and such things. If you if you do not take um, Western classical in, in this discussion, um, Indian notation notations started getting written only about uh, 150 years back. What happened before that? There was dancing, there was Beju Bhavra, there were, there were so many people. Now, Indian classical has been continuing for probably 2,000 years, if not more. So how did they do it? Okay, at this point of time, yes, now you say that Komal Re, Komal Ga, there's that and so on. Um, but ultimately when people sing, now these nomenclatures we have given after we have discovered that we can sing or we can do, do music. Then you try and, uh, try and analyze and you put these uh, nomenclatures of these notes and tiles and all those kind of things. So um, uh, the trade-off is that if, if you want to play with a band, then you have to have certain technical knowledge because you have to tell the other people what exactly are you playing. So um, uh, that is definitely there. But technique, just technique does not bring in expression and, and I think expression is the most important thing. So uh, that's a trade-off which is something which depends on each and every individual. When you talk about Indian classical music, yeah. there is improvisation yes. because there is a known structure within which you kind of improvise whatever you are. Yes. So for someone who doesn't formally learn, mm. you improvise from the heart. Now when you say you have, do you have, 
huge memory because we're going to do one and a half hours. Hmm. How do you, which, which part of it is the structure and then you, you are going to improvise within that. Hmm. So how do you, how do you go about? Because I understand not playing by, by reading, but then how do you go about recording for yourself? Look, I, I have not understood your question because you are talking about improvisation. In Indian classical you are improvising. So the memory part is very little because you are improvising. You have, you have spent hundreds and thousands of hours practicing. At that point of time, you, the memory is of a particular structure. So if you have a particular, say a mukra, and on that you are uh, you are uh, you are improvising, so then you know that after this mukra, I'm going to come to the, another mukra, which where I'm going to probably uh, go into another tal, or I'll you know, go into another tempo. So what you have to remember are the just the tukras. Right, but huh. if you don't have that structure, yeah. then where is the improvisation? Like, how? Basically, I'm trying to understand how do you, you, you know, you play, you like something, you want to build on it. Right. Do you no. just play enough that you remember it and then you keep building on it? No, no, no. Um, that is definitely there. Definitely there. Practice, being in practice is a must. Okay, you cannot do without that. Uh, but, but it is. It will be wrong to say that my compositions do not have structure. What I do not follow is a formula, which I think is 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 a uh, is something which is being adhered to for a long time, especially in a in the commercial setup, and uh, which takes away from expression in my belief. Um, uh, but uh, I definitely have structures in my uh, uh, songs. Say if I if a melancholy case, say I'll just play a little bit. There is a mukra because. Okay, first I answer it. Yes, the question first. 
Um, the hegemony of voices, I, I do agree that in a band, uh, uh, it's very unfortunate that people do not utilize the strength of the other instruments and they go only for the band and the, uh, the, the voices and the band becomes a backup band and uh, the instrumental the instrumental parts become really really uh, a secondary aspect of a band which should not be the case then you do not should not call it a band if a band is there then the weightage of each and every individual of that in that band should be felt by the listener and if you are not doing that then probably you're failing somewhere so um uh, I don't think the voices, when the voices came in, initially we used the voices almost like an instrument. We'll take just probably two words or three words and improvise on that. And um, um, that's how uh, the, the, the vocals came. Say, uh, uh, from the ruins where Oshin takes the, he sings an, uh, a shloka. So that slope, he's, he, he um, very beautifully composed his own vocal part on a particular number which was there with me for many, many years. But when it happened, there was something very beautiful because everything came together. I, I don't think that at that point of time you, you could, I mean, there would, were um, uh, numbers where probably the guitar would be more emphasized upon and uh, there were uh, pieces where even the vocals came out uh, to be um, uh, more prominent than the guitar. That happened in the late, later years. If it sounds good, I have no problem with that. But if it is forcefully done that you know only vocals have to come, then there is a problem with that. So, uh, and uh, you you are asking me about uh, this. Uh, Sarangi, Sarangi, I tried to emulate, it's not just that I brought out the Sarangi sound on my guitar. Because when I worked with the Sarangi players from Rajasthan, I really loved certain ways they maintained the beat pattern. And the beat pattern had a kind of a hum, uh, almost a half a melody, and uh, but yet supported the voices or some, certain other things that were happening in the music. And um, uh, but there was something continuous about it. So uh, in Desert Rain, um, uh, this is the riff that came up first. <laughs> If I do not have a sound, what do I do? So I have to use the guitar. Because in the band there was no other uh, um, thing that would be able to produce something which would have that effect of a sound. So I did not quite just uh, emulate the sound of a sound. I tried to replace it in a way which I thought could have been done on the guitar. I wanted to know, given how organically your music has drawn from you know, Hindustani classical and from music from all over the world, like you've described, how do you respond to categories that are used to describe the music, like fusion? What's your feeling? Uh, do you feel the need to categorize or label the music at all? Not at all. Not at all. I, I, I hate categorizing my own music. And I think by categorizing music, especially if when men uh, musicians themselves categorize their music, I think they uh, restrict their own expression. Because unless and until, uh, look, th there, are, there are so many boundaries, boundaries that we have drawn within ourselves, okay, or around ourselves. Um, and various kinds. One is, okay, fine, one is Western, one is Indian. Okay, that's very much, much broader uh, categories. But not so broad categories are these gharanas. 
Now, um, karanas are. Um, I think I think when I speak to a lot of classical musicians and I find them, you know, why are they doing it to their music and their expression? But it's looking down upon one karana looks down upon the other karana. Oh, they do it like that. We don't do it like this, and all those kind of things, which is um, which is very unfortunate, I think. But but there are people like Jim and Joshi say, um, if you hear a singing, and uh, he was from Kirana Karana, but uh, if you hear a Jayjavanti of his, and if you hear a Fayyaz Hussain Khan, much much older person, his uh, Jayjavanti, you will find. There are certain things that he took from his singing, whereas Fayyaz Hussain Khan was from, I think, Agra Gharana. So people like Hinsin Joshi actually break away. They don't care. A Kumar Gandhar broke away from that. But people who follow Kumar Gandhar, they also tend to make it into another Gharana. Whereas Kumar Gandhar himself never believed in Gharanas. So these are boundaries that we have uh, uh, this thing. It is good for a music company to label them because at least you'll be able to tell people who come to a shop to buy something that you might get something like this. At least if, we are there, if they are saying fusion, you would not hear a heavy metal. You know, that kind of broad categorization is probably good for leading a certain way of life. But any kind of art form, being categorized like this, I think you are restricting yourself, which is very unfortunate, in my opinion. I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, given that you and Indian Ocean were pioneers uh, at a time when there were very few Indian bands, yeah. uh, comparing to today when there are so many more, right. um, what do you feel about Indian band, modern Indian? Western influenced music? Do you listen to it? Are there any bands you have a particular feeling for? Um, uh, there are two or three ways of looking at, at this. One thing I'm very, very happy about, which was not there. It's not just that there weren't any bands during my time. There were lots of bands when I developed certain techniques on the guitar. Lots of bands came to, running to me, so why do you come and play and lead with us? I said that I either play my music or your own music, but I'm not going to play covers. They ran away. So there were no people playing their own music. That has started now, which is very good. I think that's a very, very positive sign. Um, uh, uh, but uh, getting Western influence, look, the thing is that there are some, there, there are certain things, most of the Pakistani band, I'm sorry, I'm categorizing out here, but most of the Pakistani bands that I hear, I see Ghazal being sampled on a rock beat pattern. Okay. For me, after a while, it's very boring. Okay. Um, there are bands who are composing their own stuff out here, but in a very, very Western format. Um, unfortunately, you know, people out here, uh, sometimes when they say that we are, we are a blues band. I have heard lots of very good blues, but blues is not our music. It is not coming from within. Blues is songs about the blacks in America, their woes. I have enough woes in India to talk about than, than, than going and singing the blues. I have much, much more of uh, culture and uh, uh, vast repertoire of the different kinds of music in, the, in this country. Why should I go looking for Yes, sir. If you play me blues, I'll appreciate it. For me, if you ask me, after a while, blues becomes very boring. Twelve bars being repeated, 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 repeated. So after a while, I say, okay, fine, I've heard about three bars, uh, three cycles. Now, fourth cycle, I would like to go and play my own stuff or hear something else. Uh, by and large, there are some very beautiful blues players. I do agree. But um, again, um, uh, that kind of influence now, 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 now to bring together the influences of different kinds in a very uh, synergetic way is something. Again, I think the first question that was asked: um, technique versus expression. 
Now, technically, you can marry any kind of music with any kind of music. But will that lead to expression? Is the question. And that is a question that has to be answered by the, the, um, uh, by the sensitivity of the musician. Any other? Yeah. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Oh, okay. So, right from your uh, first album till, I mean, I've been kind of worshipping whatever you've been playing. Uh, you know, Beat, Genie, Kandisa, all the way up to Neptune's Dance and Wild Epiphany. I have one question that in all your songs, uh, the guitar, your guitar lines have always been in kind of a synergy with the song. Kandisa, the flavor of the song and what you are playing. But in that one song, Sone Ki Nagri, the song has been sung in a totally different way and what you are adding is completely different. It's the chord structure is changing even, you know, when the vocals come in and then you cut across and the vocals come in. Was it a conscious decision to work the guitar lines or was it a masala piece which you had already made and you fit it to the song? Uh, firstly, uh, the song was made for a movie. It was not something that we did for ourselves. Um, secondly, I myself do not like that song. <laughs> so, uh, there are mistakes people do and I admit to the mistake that I made. So, I, I am absolutely there with you. You have put it in a very sweet way. You could have slapped me for it, but uh, thank you for not doing that. You mentioned that you became very interested in Hindustani music at about 11th or 12th standard. Okay. And I'm just wondering why that didn't happen earlier. Were you not exposed to Hindustani music as a child? Um, because uh, a, uh, my, my family, they love music. They're not a musical family. So there was not much of Indian classical that was being played uh, within, the, um, within the household. Um, it was around 11th or 12th, I fell in love with this uh, older girl whose father was heavily into Indian classical music. And she used to go with her father and I used to tag along. That's the reason I went and started hearing these mastros and I realized that, wow, what was I listening to? And that's how I actually was introduced to Indian classical music. So. Uh, yeah. yeah. Where is that? There you are. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so we uh, watched Dealing Home and from what we learned from him, uh, I just get this feeling. Do, do you not like lyrics in your music? I, I have a feeling because your earlier, Indian Ocean's earlier numbers, <coughs> at least for me personally, uh, form that meditative thing that you talk about and you listen to it again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Not so much the ones that came in later prop. Is it, does it, is it a measure of not because you had become a busy band by then and you spent lesser time developing the musical scores? And uh, also the second part of the question is, do you prefer numbers with less words in it? And would you rather use voice as an instrument itself? Look, I have nothing against words being used in a song. Um, uh, a lot of people seem to be thinking that, but I really do not. But I do not like the dependence on lyrics because that is what is going to be liked by the ma masses. That is something which I do not want. Therefore, if, if, you, if you think like that, then you are making music for the masses. You are making it into an industry and any art form turning, uh, turned into an industry, you have killed that art form. So that is something which I am against is to forcefully bring in lyrics into a particular composition. There are, I mean, some of the finest songs in the world, Imagine, by John Lennon. I think it's one of the finest numbers. I mean, what lyrics and what tune and what a marriage of the two. So, I have nothing against it. If you hear another Bangla song called Shokno De Bhubole by Moshumi Bhavabhomi, you would love it. So, I have nothing against lyrics. But what happens is that uh, when I compose, I compose the music first. I'm not a lyricist. So, um, uh, when uh, I compose the music first and the lyricist, I mean, 
by and large, I have worked with Sanju, who's been working with uh, Indian Ocean, and he really feels my music and writes beautiful lyrics. But too much of lyrics, I always get a bit scared of because it starts taking away from the musical composition itself. So um, even in uh, this thing, in uh, Chronicles, in my last two albums, there are lyrics, not in all the songs, there are lyrics, but not too many. And I think a lot can be said with very few words. If you actually see Imagine written down like a poem, it's not a very big, long poem. So, uh, a lot of things can be said with very little things. And if I really want to express only through words, and if I do not have the capability to marry it with my music, then I would rather write poetry or po prose. Because a lot of poetry is there, which is beautiful poetry, which has never been made into a song. So again, I have nothing against lyrics. Till the time they beautifully come together with the music, with the composition. For me, for me, I am a musician first, and then probably I have grown certain aesthetic sense to appreciate different kinds of lyrics or poetry or um, prose or other kinds of art forms, be it cinema or uh, painting or anything else. Um, but for me, uh, when I'm composing, music is the first thing that happens. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'll just take a minute because I think another gentleman also mentioned leaving home and very rarely do we get to meet a director of a film. I think because he said, Jerry, I want to tell you, we really love that film. And Jerry, where is Jerry Bhatia? Yeah. It was absolutely, absolutely, absolutely stunning. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Three, uh, how many of you, you had how many, about 300 hours of footage, right? 197, okay, I went a bit overboard. But 197 to, to have that much of footage and cut it to two hours is hats off, all I can say. And I was personally, I was so skeptical because, you know, um, Today I've been invited and I've been asked to talk, but I am frankly speaking, this is one of the things that I normally do not do uh, because I'm extremely critical of myself and I uh, keep trying to see exactly how to improve myself. And uh, I therefore I was very critical about uh, leaving home before I saw it for the first time because it was all about us, and uh, but it was really, really beautifully and sensitively made. I, Completely, I thank Jerry for that. Very beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the thing is that uh, you were saying that uh, you moved away from Indian Ocean to Chronicles. Uh, I would like to know what made you go away from uh, the established group to starting something new? Uh, there are a couple of reasons. Actually, I did talk about it a little. Uh, a, I, um, I realized that uh, one does not live more than once and uh, 23 years was a long time to be with one band, although you have started it yourself. Um, so there were other things to explore in life, even though it was in music itself. So that was one. And secondly, also probably there were. It's not this that it cannot possibly be. You, could, you cannot be uh, together for uh, 23 years and have no disagreements. But disagreements were there throughout. Because when you're composing together, there were disagree disagreements and we agreed not to agree. Sometimes we um, didn't agree and did not talk about that particular topic at all. So uh, uh, ultimately, I think there were certain, um, also there were some ideological reasons uh, which were taking us a little bit apart. Um, but frankly speaking, it is not that, because if that had been the reason, I would have been very bitter. I'm not bitter. I'm very happy Indian Ocean is continuing. 
and I am continuing with my own uh, journey once again, starting. So there is another new learning curve that has happened. So um, yeah. there were differences, but I actually wanted to explore more because there were certain things that I was not being able to explore anymore with the battery. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Renee. Um, I've been following and um, listening to your band since uh, 2008. And I was wondering, since like, after all the questions are over, can you please say something like Kalisa or Jeannie or even Ala Mana? <laughs> I really like your music. I was wondering if you could play something like that. Uh, look. Kandisa, all these are songs and just to play it on the guitar is, is very difficult. So what I'll do, I'll... Um, should I or should I, should I not? Because I have consciously not been playing Indian Ocean numbers because that defeats the purpose of moving on. But I will probably just give you a taste of Kandisa, another interpretation, just on the guitar. And just because... Look, and this is the whole band was, was playing together. Once I come into the beach pattern, if you can clap lightly so that I can just about hear, that would be nice. It will give me a good support to play the piece. And if the synergy doesn't happen, then stop clapping. <laughs> so let me see if I can do something with Kandisa.
So uh, we're wondering if you would like to play something uh, of your more recent yes. work and uh, then you would have to call it a day. Okay, I'll do that and I'm wondering what to play. There's this huge type of problem that I've built. Uh, let me see. Thank you. 
Well, this is absolutely no, it is not yet fully baked, but I thought I've got such a beautiful audience, let me try this number out. It is really, really not yet fully baked. But thank you so much, thank you so much. We'd love to thank Photo Country Arts, um, Anmol, Sarita, and uh, uh, Abhishek, otherwise probably I wouldn't have been here. Um, and also uh, Abhijit, Vinod, for doing the sound and helping me out in various different ways. Would love to come back and perform in Bangalore. So, um, and next time I would not talk, I, I promise. <laughs> I'll, I'll pray. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sushi. And thank you all of you for being here uh, once more. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, the book, Ocean to Ocean, is outside. Uh, HarperCollins has set up a stand, so if you want to buy the book, you could do that. Also in August, uh, since there are so many fans of the film Leaving Home here, uh, I'm very glad to announce that uh, Toto Fanzi Arts has organized a screening of all four of Jaydeep Burma's brilliant films. So they will all be screened uh, in Bangalore and there will be a discussion uh, with JD after that. So thank you JD for doing that for us. So please do come then and on 3rd July we have the next event of Photo Fun Arts which is a book reading of Shampurna Chatterjee's book. Uh, so please follow the blog and the Facebook page, you'll get all the information there. Thank you very very much once again. Good night. Thank you Shushan.